here today to talk with a very special person who's got a very special story to tell. And, um, you know, I think we take advantage of uh, rescue services and fire services in our city, and we kind of forget that they're there until we hear the sirens going. But there's quite a history here with Sarnia's fire services here in Sarnia. And Phil Egan is here, who has written a book about uh, the fire services here in Sarnia. Phil, thanks for joining us here today. Thanks for having me, Dave. Tell us the title of your book. It's called Walking Through Fire, The History of Sarnia's Bravest. Okay. Now, how did this come about for you? Like, uh, you just woke up one day and said, oh, I'm going to write a book. Like, there's, there's a personal <laughs> connection here for yeah. you. Uh, tell that story. Well, there is a personal connection because my family has a long association with the fire department. Um, I lost my sister Frances in a house fire in 1985. It was a, an unprotected home, so in other words, a... Right a house that had no uh, smoke detector, and this okay. was before uh, smoke detectors were mandatory in Sarnia and in Ontario for that matter, but um, she had just moved into uh, her first apartment. She was 24 and uh, working as a waitress at one of the restaurants here, Tang's as a matter of fact. Oh, yeah. And um, in the middle of the night, about 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, the wiring ignited. Uh, I guess whoever owned the home had decided they were going to do their own wiring. It's never a good idea. And um, the house got fire. And uh, there was a young family living downstairs who managed to get out. But the fire raced up the, uh, uh, up the walls, and, um, and Francis was killed by smoke inhalation. Mm -hmm. So... This really upset my father, who was a master electrician. Oh, okay. And um, yeah, so it was sort of a double whammy. But um, he called the family together. We have a big family. I'm the oldest of 10. And asked us to do something in Francis's name to dedicate ourselves to becoming advocates for fire safety. And so I remember writing a brochure about smoke detectors and. Uh, the family had 22,000 of them delivered across town, oh, wow. explaining the importance of smoke detectors and, uh, and the danger of living in an unprotected home. And um, my brothers and the kinsmen who, were, who already had a smoke detector fund, right. uh, but there were about 200 family members, electricians, um, firefighters, who went through the south end of the city where there's still a lot of wooden homes oh, right. and um, gave away um, free smoke detectors, in some cases actually going in if people were elderly and installing them for them. Oh, okay. And so we then started to um, campaign for a mandatory smoke alarm bylaw in Sarnia. And by the end of the year, um, the family was successful in having that um, put through. And um, it became mandatory uh, to have a smoke detector in every home in Sarnia. Um, my parents were named to the mayor's honors list. This was yes. Mayor Marcel Sadi, right. uh, who, who actually began that tradition. And uh, ever since then, we've, we've kept this connection going. A couple of years later, my brother Larry, who was living in Ottawa at the time, picked up the paper one day and read this story about a young seven-year-old who'd realized his house was on fire. Um, his parents were out of the, in, in the barn. This was an area just outside of Ottawa. Um, he crawled into his one-year-old sister's bedroom. Oh. She was sitting on the floor with, holding a doll with its hair on fire. Oh, wow. And he crawled out of the house with her. He sort of dragged her out of the house. And <clears throat> in this story in the Ottawa Citizen, uh, they quoted, the Ottawa reporter quoted this young seven-year-old as saying that he'd learned to do this when Ottawa firefighters had come into a school right. and shown the children how to get out alive. Right. And that was the name of the program, Get Out Alive. So my brother called the Ottawa Fire Department, and to make a long story longer, they came down to Sarnia with the permission of the uh, school boards and the... Uh, Sarnia Fire Department, right. gave a demonstration of this Get Out Alive program uh, in, the, in a couple of the schools, St. Teresa's and Our Lady of Mercy. And, um, and ultimately, um, this was brought in. But in the meantime, the Tang fire happened. Right. Um, and this was a fire <clears throat> in the apartments above Tang's restaurant where yeah, three young I remember that. 
three young children were, were killed. And my family was very close to the Tang family. Five of my brothers and sisters had actually worked there. Okay. So the observer, knowing about the Get Out Alive program and the fact that it had been demonstrated in Sarnia, actually got behind this program then, urging the city that now, you know, before there was another tragedy mm -hmm. to bring this into the schools. And so it was done, and um, I think something like 60,000 children have been uh, exposed to this program in That's the years fantastic. since. And, um, and so, uh, you know, they, they do it with what they call a fire safety house. Yes. It began with them bringing props actually into the classroom, um, showing, including a smoke machine. Oh, okay. Showing children, you know, that you know the, the the air was safest down on the ground. And I remember, you know, back I'm a little bit older, but I remember the stop, drop, and roll days. You know, that was well, that was part of that program. It yeah. came in later. Right. Uh, it was an addition to Get Out Alive. Yeah. But that basic program is still um, in the schools. And in I was going to say, so today. this still happens in our schools. Uh, absolutely, today. that's good to know. You know, it's interesting, uh, and thanks for sharing. That's a, a, a very powerful story, and. Uh, I think it's an important story that you just told because, <clears throat> again, as I, I, I mentioned at the beginning of the interview, we, we tend to, and I don't think we mean to, but we just tend to take advantage of the fact that there's, you know, there's a few fire halls in our cities and they're down the street and, and they're there and ready and these programs that you're talking about are, are in our schools. Um, you know, we, we have, uh, I've got smoke detectors in my home. I don't know that they're there because I... I, uh, I go about my daily life and I forget that they're there, but I do know they're there and, and the importance of testing them as well and making sure that things work. Absolutely. I mean, the, the book is full of stories yeah. about, you know, especially in the chapters that deal with Francis's death. Uh, the book is full of stories about this kind of thing, Dave. Situations where, you know, firefighters went in and into a, a home after a fire where there were fatalities and found that they had a smoke detector, but the batteries were dead. Yeah, yeah. You know, so you may as well not have had one at all. Uh, there are stories of fires where, you know, people who had smoke detectors were able to escape. Right. Uh, those who didn't have them were not. Yeah. So and it's really just a simple thing, right? Like <laughs> simple it's, thing. It should be, but <laughs> a simple thing, but it, unfortunately, it sometimes takes this kind of a tragedy yeah. to bring home the importance of yeah. having this kind of protection. Yeah. Well, you've done well uh, in keeping uh, true to your father's promise, uh, and that's fantastic. Let's talk a little bit more about relationships between fire departments. I know uh, one of the things you talk about is the relationship between Sarnia and Port Huron. Yes. And uh, we Sarnia almost burnt to the ground uh, a long time ago. Time and time again, the Port Huron firefighters came to the aid of Sarnia. And you're right. I think the city, the town at the time, <coughs> in the 1860s would have burned to the ground without their help. Um, back in 1859, for example, Sarnia was a town of 800. Yeah. Port Huron was already 800 a, people at yeah. Sarnia. Port Huron was already <laughs> a city of 4,000. And back in those days, the fire brigades were celebrated. You know, it was a big deal. Every civic function included a parade of, yeah. you know, the, the, fire, the fire brigades were valued because, of course, the homes were all wooden. Uh, you know, particularly in winter when it got dark earlier, you know, the oil lamps came out and, and fire was a constant hazard. Mm -hmm. And so the communities had to work together to protect themselves. Uh, in fact, one of the first, um, there were four Sarnia fire companies at one time, and one of those companies fought their first fire in Port Huron at the Miller House Hotel. Um, but time and again, Entry after entry in the index to the book are references to the Port Huron Fire Department. And in fact, even, you know, sometime later, like uh, after 9-11, when border security really tightened up, yeah. uh, we, we have this example of the uh, cooperation between Sarnia and Port Huron, unhindered problems at the border if there's an emergency. You know, we talk about a situation in New York uh, state where a, um, a, f a f fire truck from Quebec was coming to the rescue of a small uh, New York state town just over the border. Wow. We were actually stopped at the border. Yeah. Uh, sirens blazing, sirens going and everything. Another situation where an ambulance was taking a Windsor 
patient to a hospital in Detroit. And not only was the driver stopped, but he was taken into secondary. Right. That doesn't happen here. Yeah. You know, we have a much... Um, and you think there'd be a communication thing going on there. Yeah, you would think. <laughs> but, it, you know, it, it's all Call in the way ahead, you know, communities develop. And, and yeah. that developed here at a very early stage. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, even as recently as 2006, when the Abbott boat fire happened oh, yeah, right. here in Sarnia, yeah. all five Sarnia fire halls were involved. The port here in the fire department sent a truck over to right. station at East Street just in case. Uh, there was another fire in the city at the same time while right. our whole um, fire department was occupied. Right. There's, a, there's definitely a brotherhood, I guess, if you will, that's very uh, much uh, intertwined. Yeah, and, and it, again, started at a very early age where the fire companies used to compete with each other, um, testing their skills, and, uh, and um, you know, so it's a tradition that uh, yeah. remains reflected in the mutual aid right. pact that we have today with Port Huron. You must have gone through um, I, I, an, an editing process is always difficult. You know, I know I myself doing some you know video work. Sometimes I go, wow, I really don't want to take that out because that's really good. But there's time constraints and there's uh, page limits, I guess, in your case. And and then sometimes uh, aside from that, coming up with the title. Did you did you? You know, for how me, did you it's, come to this one. It's funny. The titles for me were the easiest part. Okay. I, I think, but you're right. I mean, they say that every writer needs an editor, and I was fortunate, uh, and I'll explain. But um, I started it by amassing as much information as I could, and I put together a 250,000 word timeline of events right. from uh, the fire at the Skillbeck House in 1840 that actually gave Richard Emmerich Vidal uh, the incentive to hold a town meeting to create a hook and ladder company, <laughs> um, right through to the, uh, the fire of the boat building uh, just a couple of years ago. And so once I had all this information together, it was simply a matter of going through the timeline and selecting um, the items that I wanted to talk about in chapters. Mm -hmm. And so the book wound up with 50 chapters, I think 47 of them were original chapter titles that I had put together before I even started writing the book. Wow. And then with the editing, I'm very fortunate because I come from a big family of either writers or electricians. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so um, my sister Mary Jane was one of my editors. She just uh, retired from a copy editing job at the London Free Press. My brother Paul is a, um, an investigative journalist for the Detroit Free Press. My brother Court, who has two master's degrees in English, um, works at the University of Guelph in the library, and um, and his you wife. Got a team here. Yeah, I, I was <laughs> lucky. Yeah, um, because uh, it's great when you can lean on your brothers and sisters and don't, in fact, have to pay them. Yeah, but there you go. <laughs> uh, they were they were incredible, and they all found things that that um, I had missed. Right, and um, yeah, they bring a different perspective to it, right? And and it's a much better book because of their help, without a doubt. Yeah, that's fantastic. So, how did you come to the title? Well, it it actually was a funny story because one St. Patrick's Day, I saw an ad online um, for a, a foundation operated by Dennis Leary. Oh, okay. Now a Boston guy and and a, and a big supporter of the Boston Fire Department. And he was selling a t-shirt with a logo emblazoned on it titled, For Those Who Walk Through Fire. All right. And I thought, that's right. That's exactly what these men do. Yeah. Men and women, I should say. Walking we do have fire. women now in the fire department. But um, So I thought it was an appropriate title, Walking Through Fire. The history of Sarnia's Bravest, I mean, this does tell uh, the entire definitive story of Sarnia's Fire Department yeah. from 1840 for 177 years. And and it also is very much a Sarnia history as well because I, I came to the conclusion fairly, fairly early that I couldn't tell this 177-year-old story without explaining what was going on in Sarnia right. at the same time. So it's very much Sarnia's newest history book as well. That's fantastic. Well, and now we're going to get an opportunity to, uh, people are going to get a chance to meet with you and purchase the book, and you're going to, you're going to sign your life away, so to <laughs> speak, and give some autographs, and, 
Uh, you know, I, I thank you very much for your time here today. It's it's really been fantastic. not at all, Dave. I enjoyed talking to you, and yeah. and, uh, and we could chance. talk for hours, I'm sure, yeah. about this book. And we'll have to come back and re revisit uh, again, and you can tell some more stories. That would be but great. Now, wh when is this happening? Uh, for so people to meet the you? book launch is July 15th. That's a Saturday. It'll operate from uh, 10 in the morning until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. Uh, we've got hot dogs and hamburgers that we're going to make available at lunchtime. We've got vintage fire trucks on display. Yeah. Uh, we're Bring the be, kids out, right? Yeah, absolutely, because it's an opportunity to get their pictures with the old trucks. Yeah. And um, and there there will be firefighters there displaying their new fire safety house. Right. It's an inflatable uh, house with a kitchen and a bedroom and a slide from the window. And uh, there will be firefighters on hand to do demonstrations, show children how to escape from a burning home. That's Safely. Phil, once again, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dave. Time. Appreciate it. Phil Egan and Walking Through Fire. And uh, you heard all the information. Get out there and uh, visit this wonderful gentleman who will be more than happy to talk to you and share some stories. Thanks again, everybody, for watching uh, for the Video Show Network. I'm David Burroughs. Until next time. You've been watching a one on one spotlight interview on the Video Show Network, Sarnia Lampton's online community channel. Visit our website today at tvsn.ca.